My name is Dr. Scott Sigmund. I'm an orthopedic surgeon specializing in sports medicine. I'm going to talk today about my 30-month experience with the BioBrace implant, a novel soft tissue augment with strength. I've been doing this for a little over 30 years at this point. And what I've really started to come to grips with and trying to understand what the best path forwards in the care that we provide for our patients is recognizing that orthopedic surgery is not just a mechanical problem, but there's also a biologic problem. I think moving forwards to have success, to take our failure rates for rotator cuffs, for example, upwards of 20 to 30% in the literature, closer to 10 or 5% failure rate, our ACL tear rates, 10 to 20% in the literature for retail rate. What can we do differently? The data for orthobiologics is, is gathering by the day. PRP, BMAC, all of these various things. So the question becomes, as surgeons, what can we do better to increase the odds of healing for our patients? Identify the mechanical problem, but you must add some biology to the process to be able to generate a better healing response. So the BioBrace treatment concept, the idea is, is to what can we do to strengthen our repair and add the biology at the same time. So it's a bioinductive scaffold that basically helps to prevent gapping or retears to tendons. And it was basically engineered both for uh, strength as well as biology. And we'll talk about that as we move forwards. Commercially available in two uh, sizes, which is why if you can think about a surgical procedure in orthopedics, someone has thought about using the BioBrace whether it's the 23 by 30, which can be used for the broader tendons, or also a 5 by 250, which can be used for ligament reconstruction across multiple joints as well. So lots of various options on how this can be used. Platform technology, over 4,000 implants have been utilized in the US at this time. 42 different unique procedures across the knee, the shoulder, the hip, um, as well as the ankle. There have been no known device-related adverse events with, with regards to collagen, which is an issue. The two sizes can be trimmed on site, on the table, to fit to the patient the way that you want to, especially the longer implant can be used in multiple places as well, and we're gonna show you a great example of that. And then utilizing existing reimbursement and payment mechanisms as well. So, the scaffold design, I want you to think about rebar and cement, okay? So the biology is the collagen. The collagen comes from the Achilles tendon of a cow species in New Zealand. Uh, we're very green. Uh, these cows were getting sacrificed for meat anyway. We're not uh, chopping off their heels for us, but they were getting thrown in the trash. So instead of going in the trash, we're repurposing them and using them for biology in humans. I love that uh, concept as well. So then you also have PLLA, which runs through as well. That's the rebar in the concrete. What that does is gives immediate day zero improvement in strength to your uh, surgical uh, plan that you're utilizing in construct as well. So uh, let's talk about the Goldilocks scaffold, if you will. Okay, so to the left, you've got a synthetic scaffold, but you can see it's not very porous. If you're a fibroblast, you're gonna have a hard time growing into that stuff. It's just gonna stay there, it will not change or move. To the right, there are other collagen scaffolds that are available as well that do not have any PLLA fibers. Also good for healing, but do not add any immediate strength to your repair. So Goldilocks is in the middle. You've got good strength and you've got good biology happening simultaneously. So the rapid infiltration of the host cells, your blood vessels come in, you have platelets, PDF, growth factors, et cetera. Fibroblasts come in behind. The fibroblasts are the healing cells of the body. As we know, they create the collagen effect, remodel the collagen, and then this implant becomes part of the tendon itself. So I wanna be clear, this is not a flat tire where you pop a patch on, on day one, you're good to go and you roll out of the garage, right? There's a biologic process that's happening incorporating this patch into uh, that tire, if you will, your rotator cuff or whatever. And basically that's where you're gonna get that increase in biology as well. Demonstrated uh, in preclinical studies with a sheep model, rapid integration at six weeks, thicker tendons at six to 12 weeks via MRI, and then also the repair was as strong as native tissue at 12 weeks in this preclinical model as well. So rotator cuffs, we're all doing them, right? 
And the question is, why is there such a high failure rate with so many of the techniques in which we're doing? So they're not going away. The question is, what can we do to get better at the treatment? Again, there is study after study after study which demonstrates that these rotator cuffs are not healing. We're all familiar with the ROWE score, right? You, you calculate the score based on the, what the tendon looks like. Is it degenerative? Is there fat atrophy? The age of the patient, the occupation and the work things that they do. A ROWE score of seven or up has a higher failure rate, though, and six below has a better chance. So the question becomes, can we get some of those ROWEs, six and sevens and eights, to go on to heal? That's really what we're trying to accomplish here. So if you think about synthetic versus biologic, where do you want to be? Again, you want to be in that zone in which you have reinforced bioinductive implant. You want to have biology and you want to have strength as well. So sutures and tapes don't turn into tendon. They can stress shield, potentially cause issue. Allograft provides mechanical support, but it never grows into its own tissue. So the concept is the collagen helps to allow the biologic process as well. So it is really a strong implant. It's pretty impressive what you can do with this thing. So it weighs less than a gram, but for the five millimeters up to 140, if you double it up, 280 newtons, the larger patch upwards of 515 newtons associated with strength. You can put a single stitch through it, you can put a horizontal mattress through it, and it will hold, it will stay, and you can suture and tie directly into that implant with confidence that you're operating. So this is the Joe Burns uh, was demonstrating for us here, uh, his technique of how you can incorporate a biobrace into a chairlift, uh, and you can see that right in here. Literally, there's your biobrace implant with suture, and you can lift a chair right off the ground. So uh, immediate strength at time zero to your repair. My friends make fun of me. They say, Siggy, you're letting your rotator cuffs do burpees in the PACU. Well, I do believe in progressive uh, uh, therapy for my patients, especially if I provide them the strength that we're looking for. Early range of motion helps to dictate vectors to your fibroblasts so they know how to perform and where they lay down the collagen and you get good healing. So adding that strength immediately gives us a sense of real confidence as we're doing our repairs. So this is one of my cases here. We published it in, in Joey, the Journal of Orthopedic Experience Innovation. It's a case report. A uh, primary rotator cuff repair that was performed with Dermis on Demand. The reason we did use Dermis on Demand is that she had a reaction to another company's collagen implant on the opposite side, so we didn't want to use the same implant. Uh, she then uh, went on to surgery, had pain and weakness after traumatic injury, and you can see here went on to a repeat type 2 tear pattern. Uh, so we decided at that point this was going to be one of our earliest patients. I believe this is my second or third patient. We felt that she was the perfect candidate. As usual, Dave Hook gives me a call with the, the next greatest idea, and I usually say no until I say yes, and here we go. So you can see here, uh, this is the, the process. We followed her out through uh, upwards of a year at this point. You can see her pre-op MRI scan, and then you can see in the center where her three-month MRI I'm feeling pretty happy. There's a rotator cuff going all the way down to the footprint. Uh, we've got still some fluid in the subacromial space, but still looks good. And then here at eight months, there's still that maturation of the, of the tendon that's happening. The fluid's going away. And clinically, this patient was doing exceptionally well. Uh, we're going to go over my technique, uh, which is highly reproducible at this point uh, and really does not add a significant amount of time. Uh, it's really sort of you know, sort of taking all the things that we've learned from SCR and arthroscopic repairs and then incorporating this new implant into this. And I want to be clear, the patients that I am operating on, I'm going to show you my data. This is not your next door neighbor's one centimeter little type one, you know, rotator cuff tear, the supraspinatus. These are all ROWEs, six, seven, eights. They're all degenerative tear patterns with atrophy on my primaries. The ones that I would anticipate would not heal. All of my revisions as well. These are all patients that are being done with the use of the Biobrace implant. So you can see here in the case report, what was interesting here, this, we went back to take another look uh, to see what was going on. She had some bicipital pain. Uh, the the uh, rotator cuff had come down onto the footprint on the articular side. Uh, and then also, you could barely see where the implant was over top of the rotator cuff at our second look. You can see her, uh, her clinical uh, patient report outcome scores through the roof compared to where she was preoperatively. So this was a very happy patient. This is the place where I then started saying, OK. I'm seeing a little something different than I haven't seen before. How am I going to then use this in clinical practice and where do we go? So you can see to the left, you can see the revision procedure here, and then you can see the outcomes at 10 months with the MRI scan as well as for what the implant looks like intraoperatively as well. So 
The evolution of the BioBrace implant and how I'm clinically using it in practice has evolved quite significantly to the point now where this is a highly reproducible operation. I'll either use no cannula or a low profile cannula to be able to get the implant in. Uh, I'm gonna, there's been an evolution of the graft delivery as well. We've really simplified that. And one of the most important things we've done, which I believe in really makes a difference, is we tag the lateral border of the implant. The reason we do that is we can tension the implant. We can put it into position to be able to gain immediate fixation of our rotator cuff across the footprint. Uh, and we're doing this in 30 minutes or less for most of our patients, unless it's a more complex tear pattern. So I thought we'd go through this a little bit and just sort of give you a little step-by-step -step play of what my standard repair looks like at this point. Uh, you can see here, we're gonna use a CrossFit um, medial row anchor, and we're gonna pass our sutures up and through uh, into the supraspinatus and infraspinatus complex. You'll see it's a fairly robust tear pattern, a wide open pitch here, as we like to say. We're gonna place both of our implants here medially. And then uh, as far as the, what we're doing here in particular, we're only going to use one suture front and back, although if it's a larger tear pattern, we'll incorporate additional uh, sutures into the mix as well. Um, our next step here is we're now going to pass those sutures up and through um, into the cuff. There we go. Good. And we're going to pass four suture limbs up and through. Two from the anterior medial row anchor and two from the posterior uh, medial row anchor as well. Those sutures go up and through the cuff, which help to mobilize the cuff to bring it to the footprint. And you can see here, uh, we've got our sutures passed and they're in a nice uh, uh, sort of uh, proximity and in the appropriate positions. What we're gonna do next is we're gonna take those exact same sutures and then pass them through the medial border of the BioBrace implant. That allows us to shuttle the implant into position and then we will arthroscopically tie the implant and the rotator cuff simultaneously to the footprint. I want to tell you that this is my method of fixation. There are other methods. A lot of people prefer to pass the rotator cuff and fix it first and then lay the implant over top. So there are variations on a theme that are available. But you can see here, we're going to go ahead and pass those same sutures up and through the medial border. You can see I've done some purple marking uh, to the implant there. So I'm going to identify where the lateral border of that implant is after we pass it as well. So this is all very straightforward. We're not asking you to do anything that you're not currently doing in clinical practice if you're an arthroscopic rotator cuff repair surgeon on a routine regular basis. I apologize for that cannula. Uh, they're looking at me across the hall. Uh, but uh, you can see here we're then shuttling our implant uh, into position here uh, as well. So the next thing that we need to do is to go ahead and uh, tie our medial sutures into position. And this gives you a really nice feel of how straightforward it is to be able to pass the implant, pass your sutures, do your medial row tie. So now what we want to do is we want to gather the lateral aspect of the graft because we want to increase our ability to tension and fix this graft into position. So this is my old SCR technique that we're going to do next. Basically, I'm going to pass the sutures in vivo as if it's a rotator cuff. Instead of the cuff, I'm actually passing it through the implant itself. Super easy to do. These are easy motions and movements uh, that you get skilled at back and forth. And then we pass another suture again to the lateral aspect uh, and the anterior aspect of that lateral implant. You could certainly pass those on the outside of the body, but then I feel like that's one more place you're gonna get your spaghetti and suture management issues. This way I know exactly where my sutures are and I know what's going on. So at this point, we've already now, we're basically gonna do a suture bridge. So we're gonna take our lateral row uh, sutures and then we're gonna combine that with one of the sutures anterior as well as posterior from the medial side. And we're gonna apply that in through a, a lateral row anchor and you'll be able to see our final fixation here as well. So again, very straightforward uh, motions and movements, things that you're already used to doing. Uh, we get really great fixation here uh, with our lateral row anchor and then Argo anchor here, and then we go ahead and we'll give you a nice visualization of what this looks like. And it's, uh, that's where we are, usually between 25 to 35 minutes to be able to get this done. And that is call your mother right now. That is a fantastic repair. The rotator cuff is on the footprint, large uh, degenerative type tear pattern with an augment in place where I'm feeling really confident uh, so that this patient's gonna start early range of motion within a matter of weeks we're gonna start active assisted range of motion for this patient. No abduction pillows for six weeks on my patients at the airport. That's one of my favorite things to do is to ask somebody when their surgery was with their abduction pillow and see how far out they're still wearing it. So that's my personal belief, not con meds, but that's good. So 
BioBrace, retrospective registry. How many patients have I done? What's my clinical experience? And what have my outcomes been at this point? 73 patients, 67 cuffs, and then six ACLs. We'll talk about my ACLs. I really want you to pay attention to what we're seeing here on the data for rotator cuffs as well. These are complex rotator cuff repairs. These are not the easy ones. These are the ones you're anticipating in the literature. Anywhere from 10 to 30 to 40% failure rate associated with these tear patterns. At this point, I'm 48 out of 52 are still intact with happy patients and 14 out of the 15 revisions as well. So my current re-tear rate across difficult primaries and revisions is 8%. Okay, I'd love that for it to be lower, but that's a hell of a lot lower than what it's been in my clinical practice for decades. So very pleased with that. Now, I'm also an ACL surgeon. I was primarily using um, the BioBrace for my revision ACLs, but now for all of my competitive Division I athletes in particular, uh, I am incorporating a BioBrace implant to all of their primary uh, ACLs as well. I want to increase strength. I want to give confidence that this athlete's going to do well over time. So let's talk about the knee uh, uh, briefly as well. The treatment concept you can see here is by the 5 by 250 incredible uh, strength as we've talked about, especially if you double it over. And it also provides strength and a biologic scaffold as well. The same models were done in sheep for the knee as, you, as well for histology, for MRI follow-ups, and then stronger repair at six weeks than an autograft alone. So uh, very impressive uh, data for the sheep. So clinical considerations in the knee. So clearly revision ACL surgery, right? I mean, that's something that we're concerned about. We wanna increase our chances and odds of healing for our patients in the best possible way. Uh, no one's ever taken out a hamstring, Michael Redler, uh, that's come out that's been smaller than what they anticipated, right? So the point is that happens uh, pretty frequently. And so why not have a biobrace available and ready to go instead of an, an allograft? We've all done allografts, much higher rate of failure associated with an allograft in the setting of an augment than there it, well, will be as, as far as using uh, this implant as well. Extra articular um, allograft augmentation, LETs or ALLs, uh, also uh, obviously uh, for MCL repairs, you name it when it comes to uh, tendon issues around the knee, this implant, somebody's figured out a way to use it. Uh, so definitely something to be considering as well. Um, so again, whether you're using BTB, people use it on the outlay of the BTB. Some people put it on the inside. Other people are using it for the quad, which is me. I think Amit's doing that as well. Hamstring tendons as well, augmenting the hamstring to improve your strength and size to your graft at time zero. So this is a report from uh, Sean McMillan. Uh, primary ACL, this is a patient competitive volleyball player, history of patellar tendinopathy, uh, but still wanted to do a BTB, but wanted to help out at the graft site, which is the beauty of this graft, right? It's five by 250. So you can chop it up into uh, pieces, you can use it in various places. He put it into the graft, but then he also went to the uh, donor site as well, and actually incorporated the uh, BioBrace implant to the donor site uh, as well. And you can see here uh, on his data, you can see how the patellar tendon really healed very nicely and the patient has done well. All right, we talked a little bit about orthobiologics at the start of this, right? Can you incorporate orthobiologics with a BioBrace implant? The short answer is all day long. It'll suck up as much as you want to put in there, for sure. It is a beautiful scaffold in a place for your PRP or your BMAC or whatever it is that you're currently using to be able to uh, create a, a vessel for the healing in the orthobiologics. So all day long, that's an option for you if that's something that you wish to proceed with. So the BioBrace is FDA indicated to reinforce soft tissue where weakness exists. It's combining bioinductivity and strength, optimizing healing potential. 4,000 procedures, 42 unique indications. It's off the shelf, it's room temperature, and it's available when you need it as well. You don't have to just take my word for it. There are a number of outstanding surgeons across the country at this point. Some of the people that you know very well, key opinion leaders that have been using this routinely, rotator cuffs, ACLs, subscap for total shoulders, Achilles, uh, gluteus repairs into the hip uh, as well. And you can see here uh, that there is uh, some recorded data and a randomized control trial uh, for BioBrace in the shoulder is currently enrolling as we speak. Lisa's giving me the thumbs up. That's great as well. So. Bottom line is, BioBrace, what are you going to use it for? It's been great in clinical practice. I greatly appreciate everyone's time. Happy to answer any questions.